Good morning. This is Lynn Sutton, Public Information Officer at the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, we are going to be starting here with a COVID-19 data update with Dr. Sarah Line Callow, who is the Director of the Bureau of Epidemiology and Population Health at the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Once again, I remind everyone to please mute if you are not the presenter. And uh, we're going to get started here. Sarah, take it away. Thank you. Uh, Lynn, can you hear me all right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to be giving you a presentation. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of difficulty with my slides moving forward here. There we go. Um, so, I'm going to be providing you some information today about our case rates, our mortality rates, testing information, a little bit about the healthcare system and our public health capacity in our COVID-19 response. So, as uh, to provide some national context, uh, Michigan has recorded the sixth highest number of cases in the state, uh, sorry, in the nation, in terms of states in the nation, and the fifth highest number of deaths. We have the 10th highest hospitalization rate as percent of total beds occupied by COVID-19 patients, and the sixth highest number of COVID-19 patients in the ICU. Our case rates per million people for COVID-19 are now above 500 cases per million and still climbing. Our percent positivity is over 12%. And the complaints of coronavirus like illness in the emergency department has uh, been increasing for seven or more weeks. More than 15% of the available beds, inpatient beds in the state are um, being used to treat COVID-19 patients right now. And that uh, trend is continuing exponentially over the previous five weeks. Uh, the week of November 1st, November 7th, we had almost 300 people die due to from COVID-19. And our state death rate is currently 5.2 deaths per million people. We're testing more than 53,000 people each day in the last week for COVID-19. These are diagnostic tests and our testing rate is over 6,000 uh, tests per million people. A little bit more national context. All 50 states in the nation are seeing increases over the last two weeks in the number of cases. Um, just gonna highlight the Midwest a little bit. Um, Wisconsin, we're continuing to see rising hospitalizations and case rates. Indiana now has higher hospitalization rates than Wisconsin. Um, and they have exceeded their spring peak in terms of uh, cases and hospitalization. Illinois is showing rapid growth in hospitalizations in cases. Um, and Ohio is also experiencing growing hospitalizations in cases as well as positivity. And they are now far above their spring levels. Michigan, as you'll see, has had a rapid rise in hospitalization and cases. And we're at about 75% of our spring peak right now. This uh, is a quick summary slide that we share um, with different entities. Um, this is a data poll. We look at cases from seven days prior to the um, table date. So the case information on this slide, like the absolute cases per million and the CDC case trend, you can see, I don't know if you can see my pointer on these two columns here. Um, that is from data that, uh, um, is seven days prior to uh, the 11th. We do this because we're looking at these case rates by symptom onset, um, and we want to make sure that uh, the data are fully reported before we release them. So this is where we understand that the state as a whole is at over 500 cases per million. We are continuing to grow based on uh, CDC's case trend indicator. You can see that these are the uh, Michigan Economic Recovery Council regions here, those job sharing regions. All of the regions in the state are um, over 300 cases per million. Positivity, so the number, the percent of tests um, in the state that are positive is at 12.5% and increasing. Um, all regions of the state are over 9% positivity and you can see that Kalamazoo is at 15% positivity. Um, and the positivity is increasing in all areas. Uh, testing is increasing as well. 
Um, you can see our test per million rates there. However, it's really not keeping up with um, positivity or case rates. Another thing that this uh, summary graphic gives you is um, the weekly trend in coronavirus-like symptom complaints in the emergency department. We can see that apart from a couple of regions that's been increasing over the last week um, or in some places four weeks. Um, and we're also have here the percentage of inpatient beds occupied with COVID-19 patients and our number of deaths per million people here. So it's sort of a one one-stop slide for a lot of the indicators that we track. Um, so I'm going to go through some more in depth about the those kind of indicators that you just saw. A couple of high-level messages. Um, as I said, positivity continues to increase statewide and with all of the Merck regions. Um, testing has also increased in the state, which you know is is very important trend. Um, our testing has increased 89% since October 1st. However, those percent of those tests that are positive has increased 290%. So what that tells me as an epidemiologist, when I see that the state case rate is has increased 425% during that same time, is that we need to be testing more. So it's very important that if people feel they need a test, that they, they go get one. Um, it's important that we understand where cases are occurring so that we're able to um, respond appropriately. Another high level message is that cases and deaths are rising in all age groups and among all racial and ethnic groups that we, we uh, record data for. The number of COVID-19 outbreaks that local health departments are investigating also continues to rise, particularly in long-term care facilities, schools and sports, in-person workplaces, and restaurants and bars. So this is a graphic um, that is showing you the number of, the gray bars are giving you the number of diagnostic samples tested each day. And the um, blue line is giving you um, the average percent of those tests that are positive. Um, in this case, this line includes uh, testing that is accomplished at Michigan Department of Correction facilities. When we add those facilities in, our positivity gets to about 12.1%. So you can see that um, the prior week, Michiganders had more than 57,000 diagnostic tests for COVID-19 each day. And you can see how quickly our positivity is increasing, which is an indicator to me, positivity is an early indicator that our number of cases are going to increase. Okay. Uh, this is another uh, slide that gives you a snapshot of where Michigan stands relative to other states. We continue to be in the rank, top five rank of the nation for the number of tests and the percent of the population that we're able to test each week, but we've declined in rank for the percent positivity this week, and a higher number is worse in that case. Also wanted to provide you with information about the spread of this uh, percent positivity by county. So these this is looking at the positivity rate for each county in the state between November 8th and November 14th. And you can see that most of the counties in the state averaged 10 to 20 percent positivity over that last week. Um, well, thank you very much. For Sorry, just everybody needs to mute their phone, please. I think. Thank you. So the um, it's just shifting gears a little bit, what this graphic is giving you is the um, confirmed, so these are the number of lab confirmed COVID-19 cases that are reported each day. So if you look at the michigan.gov slash coronavirus website, those are those, um, the front page of that website, these are the numbers that get put up there. Um, the gray bar is giving you the, the number of reported lab confirmed cases and the um, black line is giving you the seven day rolling average. So you can see the, the increase in that rolling average over time. And then the last week, we had more than 47,000 cases reported to us. Um, all right. Another, as an epidemiologist, the information that I'm most interested in is understanding um, when someone became ill. So this is information that the top two graphics here are looking at the number of new and confirmed probable cases um, by date of when someone stated they became ill. 
or the day that they were tested if they are asymptomatic but positive. Um, so a couple of take homes here. Uh, one more technical detail. Um, we put this little gray bar here to show that we know that the data are not fully reported at this point. There are going to be more people who have onset of symptoms now who haven't yet had a chance to be tested. So you know, as we did with uh, hepatitis A, for example, we, you know, we still look at these data, but we recognize that they're not a stable estimate yet of, of where we are. But what you can see is that these are data that um, are, we have our spring peak here. We have our elevated instance plateau in the summer in terms of the number of cases we had. And then we have this rapid exponential growth. And currently our daily case rate is over five times the rate it was from early October. Uh, current deaths, which is the lower graphic here, you're seeing the number on the right hand side, you're seeing the number of confirmed and probable deaths by the reported date. Um, the current deaths are a lagging indicator um, so that we know that these number of deaths, even if we start bringing our case numbers down, this death um, number of deaths each day is going to continue to climb. The concurrent number of deaths is over four times the number that we saw in the beginning of October. This is another way to look at the um, average daily number of new and confirmed, uh, sorry, new confirmed and probable cases per million residents by county. It just gives you an idea of, you know, where we were in the beginning of September, and then you can see how the map just becomes darker and darker with time. And currently all counties in the state are over 150 cases per million. It says information on the average daily new case rates per million residents by age group. Um, the light, lightest blue line are cases that are occurring among people who are over 70 years of age. Um, the sort of uh, the highest line here that you see this blue is people who are ages 30 to 49 years old. So the 30 to 49 year age group um, is continuing to have the highest case rate per million people, but it's important to recognize that case rates have exponentially increased for all ages in the state. So just looking at the uh, case rate per million people by uh, racial and ethnic group, so on the left-hand side of this graphic, you can see um, the, the seven-day um, case rate per million average over time. The light blue line here is representing white residents. The black line is representing American Indian Alaska Native residents. Um, the sort of cobalt blue, I guess I'll call it, the third highest line here at the end, is uh, representing case rates for black and African American residents. And then the uh, we also have case rates represented for Asian Pacific Island residents. So you can see that all groups are experiencing increase here, um, which currently um, uh, white and American Indian Alaska Native residents are having the highest case rates in the state. If you go over here to the right, we're providing you the, um, the distribution of cases by race and ethnicity for the past two weeks as well as the distribution of these racial groups in the population as a whole. So it's just another way to give you some comparative information about um, uh, what, what different groups are experiencing in the state in terms of COVID-19. I just also like to highlight that um, individuals who are uh, Hispanic Latino, the case rate for this group has been since um, middle of March has been higher than that for cases who are uh, for people who are not considered to be Hispanic Latino, but both groups have seen a rapid increase in um, their case rates this fall. Moving to the number of um, outbreaks. So what this chart is, this is uh, the same information that we put up on the website once a week. Um, this is the number of outbreaks that are under investigation by the local health department. And they report this to us in a situation report um, at the end of each week. There are many factors, including the ability to conduct effective contact tracing in certain settings that may result in underreporting of outbreaks or under identification of outbreaks. There are some outbreaks that are easier to spot or to identify than others. Um, and we give a, a sort of key to how visible we think it 
is, how each kind of setting is in terms of being able to identify outbreaks there in this uh, series of blue and black circles here. So this chart will not provide a complete picture of all outbreaks that are occurring in the state but it does provide you information about what local public health is investigating and, and dealing with right now. The absence of identified outbreaks in a particular setting, um, you know, the absence of those outbreaks is not providing you evidence that the setting does not have outbreaks in it. So just to highlight the data that are on this slide, local health is currently investigating 980 outbreaks in these different settings. The total number of active outbreaks is up 32% from the previous week. This is the highest number of outbreaks we have recorded since we began tracking these data. Following long-term care facilities and educational settings, the greatest number of new outbreaks are reported in manufacturing, construction, restaurants and bars, retail and social gatherings. And the, the new outbreak is highlighted in, um, in blue. But we can see that um, there were reported outbreaks, the total number of reported outbreaks are highest among uh, manufacturing construction, healthcare, restaurants and bars, social gatherings, offices, childcare setting, and retail setting. This is another presentation of data that are also available on the state website. These are the number of outbreaks that are associated with school buildings. So in this case, there are 200 outbreaks that involve student and or staff within a K through 12 building. Um, note that one half of the 200 outbreaks, almost one half, 97 of them occurred in high schools. And you can also see here the, the number of cases that are associated with different um, settings total cases. And we can see that 565 of the 881 um, outbreak associated cases in K through 12 schools are occurring in that high school setting. So moving into talking about mortality, um, the bar chart on the right gives you the number of confirmed and probable deaths by age group in the past 30 days. A couple things to take home here. Um, you know, the deaths are, of course, highest among people who are over age 80 on this graphic. However, you know, we are seeing deaths among people who are under age 60. And on the right hand side, you can see the age specific uh, case rates per million people. You can see that all groups are experiencing increases um, with the exception of um, some of these uh, very small rates down here. Um, and it's important to understand sort of the exponential increase in, in the mortality rate here. This is the same information for racial and ethnic groups. Um, not gonna go through the slide in detail, just wanted to highlight that we're seeing increase in all groups and we're seeing um, mortality rates highest among uh, white residents and non-Hispanic Latino residents, but all groups are experiencing increases. So moving on to talk about uh, healthcare capacity. Since September, COVID-19-like illness that is reported in the emergency department has gone from less than 2% of all emergency department visits to uh, more than 7% of emergency department visits. Hospitalizations and ICU utilization for COVID-19 is also increasing, and we're seeing doubling rates of um, two and a half to three weeks. So the number of um, patients being seen is doubling in, in a three-week time period. Five of eight preparedness regions in the state now have more than 30% of their adult ICU beds occupied with COVID-19 patients. So we wanted to share with you some data from CDC COVID tracker. Um, the purple line here is showing you the increase in the number of people um, or the percentage of uh, people in the emergency department who are seen because they have a coronavirus-like illness complaint or they have been, they've received a diagnosis of coronavirus, COVID-19 in the emergency department. And you can see this rapid increase since, since September. These are our state um, hospitalization trends. Um, this week, uh, COVID-19 patients in the hospital, we had a census that was 33% higher than last week. Um, you can see in the small graph um, on the lower right here, that we are now at 75% of our spring outbreak levels. 
but it's important to remember that these hospitalizations are spread across the entire state as opposed to concentrated in Southeast Michigan like we were in the spring. So similar graphics for um, the number, the utilization of um, intensive care units for COVID-19. Um, COVID-19 census in ICU has increased 30% this week. Statewide, about 27% of adult ICU beds are occupied by COVID-19 patients. And you can see the um, occupancy for different preparedness regions here um, on the side. So five of eight preparedness regions have over 30% of adult ICU beds occupied with COVID-19 patients. Um, and this is uh, giving you regional information about how quickly hospitalizations are increasing in these states, in these uh, preparedness regions. Regions two north, three and sixth are um, seeing the most rapid growth rates here. So now uh, moving on to public health capacity. I'm going to talk a little bit about case investigation and contact tracing. Also going to talk about testing here. So our case investigation and contact tracing um, system is, you know, becoming overwhelmed with the number of new cases and contacts that it's expected to manage. Um, so our completion rates are um, quite low right now. However, I have some good news. Uh, really want to promote the use of a phone proximity notification app. Um, that the state government just recently released. So these are case investigation metrics that we track each week. So just to take you through this graphic a little bit. Um, we have the number of cases that uh, were referred to local health between November 7th and November 13th was almost 40,000 cases were refer referred for investigation. They were able to get a full complete case investigation for about 23% of those. And you know, we have been much higher in terms of our completion rates than where we are now. Um, 9,100 cases did have a complete investigation. And I think that is the highest number that we've been able to complete um, during the epidemic. So we're certainly adding more staff. We're working hard to get to as many of these cases as we can. Among those cases that were investigated, um, about 44% of those cases could identify where they may have picked up their COVID-19, what a potential source of infection would be. Um, we want that percentage to be as high as possible in order for uh, this box it in strategy of identifying where spread may be, finding contacts of cases, um, and getting them into quarantine quickly. In order to do that, cases need to be able to know where they um, became infected. The other figure that we monitor very closely is what percentage of cases stated that they were already in quarantine at the time that they developed symptoms. Less than a third of people are in quarantine at the time that they develop symptoms. What that means is at the time when people are most infectious, they are, um, they are unfortunately um, not in quarantine and can be infecting other people. So we, we like to see that number up much higher um, than it is right now. This is another way of understanding our uh, case investigation metrics. Um, we, you can see the black line is giving you the daily number of new cases. It's a seven day smoothed average. Um, and then the blue line is giving you the number of cases that we were able to um, reach within one day, the number of contacts we, the number of cases we attempted to investigate within one day. So um, because of this influx of cases, um, we want to make sure that we're not falling farther and further behind in time. So we are, we worked with local health departments. I know a number of them have already put out press releases talking about how they are going to be prioritizing case investigation. Um, we are continuing to bring in new staff, um, additional staff, both at the local and state level to, um, you know, to bolster our, our system here. There's some good news um, in terms of the number of completed calls to the contacts of cases. Um, we've been able to turn that number around and we're now reaching 45% of known contacts within one day. Um, also, among those contacts, um, they are able to call back uh, TraceForce to ask questions and um, 
you know, to find out more information, get referrals. And calls to Trace Force have more than tripled this week, meaning that we're still able to give, you know, meaningful support, effective support to people who are isolating and quarantining. So something that I think will be very helpful for us in, in Michigan is the use of this My COVID Alert. I'll go through this briefly. Um, this can be downloaded to an iPhone or Android platforms. It's available in the app stores for um, both of those kinds of platforms. This does not track your location. So this is not something where, you know, like uh, some people's phone apps or running apps or things like that, where it actually knows where you are on the planet. All which this app does is record um, what phones your phone may have been near um, if that other phone has this app downloaded as well. So what happens is that information lives on your phone. If you become a COVID-19 case and you talk with your local health department, they will give you a code. You enter that code into the phone and the phone identifies, you know, what phone numbers you have been near for 15 minutes over a 24 hour period, and then sends an exposure notification to all of those individuals or to all of those phones for the individuals to look at. It's a very nice app. Um, more than 280,000 people have already signed up for it. Um, I think it's a way people can be proactive and can, um, can help to um, understand exposures that they may have had. Uh, a couple of new things about this app is we do have Spanish and Arabic translations um, of these materials coming very shortly. The last slide I have for you, oh, sorry, um, one last slide in the public health capacity section here is um, we do monitor the turnaround time for um, diagnostic tests in the state. So for any lab that has reported more than a thousand results in the past two weeks, we look at um, the average turnaround time in the past two weeks by those laboratories. You can see on this slide, we understand which ones are commercial, which ones are hospital. Um, our 14 day average testing turnaround right now um, is 2.7 days. So that's the time from when a sample was collected to when public health received that electronic message. We're at about 2.7 days for all the, the tests we've received in the past two weeks. So just to highlight the last thing really quickly that we, we do look at data to understand how is COVID-19 and the response to COVID-19 influencing other kinds of um, healthcare services and public health services that people make use of in Michigan. Um, and you, so a couple of things to highlight are childhood preventative services like lead testing and vaccinations. Um, childhood vaccinations did fall during the uh, springtime, but those numbers have been rebounding. We also do look at um, the use of emergency care data, um, use of emergency services, use of emergency department. So our emergency department visits currently are the utilization of the emergency department is lower than it has been in years past at this time. It's important that people understand that they can go to the emergency department if they need to. Um, it's a very important source of care. The uh, percentage of EMS transports for opioid overdose or the use of EMS, pardon me, the use of EMS for opioid overdoses has also increased um, during this year compared to last year. And then we do have some information on mental health impacts. Just going to jump to that slide really quickly. Looking at uh, the slide here, number three, what you have is the proportion of emergency department visits for mental health concerns or mental health related complaints in the um, emergency department. So you can see that um, in March, the percentage of all ED visits that mental health complaints made up increased. It has been declining or holding steady since then. Something to be aware of is that, you know, the denominator here um, declined. So when I see this increase here, that may be that more people were seeking care for it, or it may be that fewer people were seeking care for other concerns. Um, but it's important that we have some way of understanding um, uh, mental health uh, services in the state during this time. Thank you very much. I know I went a little bit long there, but I will turn it over to Lynn Seppin. Thank you, Dr. Lancalo. That was great information. Um, so we have a few minutes left for questions. I uh, really would like to tailor them to the data. Uh, so if anybody would like to ask a question, you know, please raise your hand. 
let me know that you want to talk. I will, uh, you know, call on you. Kelly Rainey, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, hello. Uh, good afternoon. I am just want to know the death rate right now seems to be lower than what it was back in May. Um, is that accurate? And if so, I mean, do we kind of have any reasoning on what that is? And is it going to get worse to continue to climb? Yeah, so the mortality rate will continue to climb even if we start bringing case rates down now because mortality um, rates tend to go up a, a few weeks, a, a couple weeks after the case rates have increased. Okay, uh, Karen Buffard, if you'd like to go from the Detroit News, go ahead. Uh, yeah, sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, when you look at the um, the demographics of the people who are uh, testing positive, um, you mentioned that the rates, the case rates are highest among white and um, Hispanic populations right now. Um, and in last outbreak, they were highest among African Americans. I'm wondering if the change in demographics is more a function of the composition of, um, you know, the population that, um, you know, the areas of the state where the outbreaks are, are greatest right now, um, you know, as opposed to, um, you know, the proportion um, of African Americans that are infected. In other words, um, is, is it really um, indicated in any way that African Americans are not subject to um, disparities in terms of severity of illness and mortality that were identified in the first outbreak? Yeah, so I think it's very important to understand that comparing the fall to the spring can be difficult because we had such a different testing environment in the spring. Um, I think the certainly um, the case rate, it's, I, I need to make really clear that the case rates that when I say confirmed and probable cases, that will include people who have had, um, who are epidemiologically linked to another case. So they have symptoms and they have exposure. It may be people who have had an antigen test. Um, so it's important to understand the difference between confirmed and probable cases. So there may be people in there who haven't received a test for COVID-19, but are part of a, an outbreak and have um, epidemiologic exposure to someone who is a COVID positive patient. Um, so in terms of your question, most certainly we are seeing, you know, in the spring, the outbreak was, um, or the pandemic was very much focused in Southeast Michigan which does have a uh, higher proportion um, African-American residents uh, than, for example, the UP. Um, and you saw in those county level maps that currently the entire state is experiencing um, very high rates of COVID-19. So, so some of this is reflective of the demographics of the state as opposed to the um, to the concept of disparities, but it is absolutely important that we continue to, we've done a lot of work to ensure that we're making testing available in communities that have social vulnerabilities and that we are um, making sure that we're getting um, masks and PPE um, to businesses and masks to individuals who may not be able to supply one for themselves. So. Thank you. Uh, Julie Mack, if you have a question, you may go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, thanks so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. I actually have two quick questions. Well, maybe they're not that quick, but one is, um, they're both from people, comments I hear from Facebook. One is the fact that the Detroit numbers are actually below the state average right now. Is that a sign of herd immunity or just that people in Detroit are being cautious or what's that about? And the other question has to do with that I see a lot on Facebook is that some of these other things like mental health issues and people not getting emergency care, the whole um, the cure is worse than the disease. And could you talk about um, about that aspect of it, that, that these unintended consequences that we're seeing is that um, how is that factoring into your thinking about restrictions and so forth? 
So I think it's a, you know, I do not have enough information on uh, people's behavior in terms of use of mask and, and things like that to really give you a solid evidence-based answer to your first question. I, I think that, um, you know, communities that have already experienced an increase in um, a, 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 have already had a, a big round with COVID-19, perhaps have more understanding of, of the effectiveness of, of masks and um, the importance of separating. Um, I think that um, your second question, I'm just going to uh, throw it out and see if Dr. Caldoun would like to say anything on that one. Thank you, Dr. Lyon Callow. Yes, to, to your second question, um, let me be clear. For, for people not coming to emergency departments, e emergency departments were not closed by any epidemic or governor's orders. Um, so it, the, the real enemy here is, is the virus. We have today, all healthcare uh, is, is open as long as they have capacity. So again, it is not an order. It is people changing behaviors, it is hospital capacity changing because of the virus. Okay, thank you, Dr. Caldoun. Uh, Maureen Halliday, if you'd like to ask your question, go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, so I actually have two questions. One uh, pertaining to testing, you're saying that testing isn't keeping up with the positivity rate. I'm wondering what the solution would be to that. How are we going to increase testing? And then, you know, there's been talks about a vaccine. When a vaccine does come out, how quickly should we expect these positivity case, positive cases to drop? I can I can take those if it's okay, Dr. Lankow. Sure. Uh, so for for testing, you're absolutely right. As we see positivity go up, it means that there are likely more cases, and we need to increase expand our testing. So we have been working incredibly hard uh, expanding antigen tests across the state, uh, focusing on vulnerable populations. Uh, I, I hope that at some point we receive more supplies for these antigen tests from the federal government. Uh, we are also looking at expanding our capacity with in-state uh, testing uh, and looking very closely in working with partners uh, across the country to inclu increase our uh, capacity there. Okay. Oh, and Thank I'm sorry, I did, not, I did not respond to the vaccine question. Yep, sorry about that. <laughs> sorry about that um, myself. So, so, yeah, so we are aggressively working to plan on vaccine distribution, uh, but there is no question the day that vaccine becomes available, it will only be available in limited quantities. It will only be available for those that the CDC <clears throat> has determined are the highest risk populations, and that will start with healthcare providers. So it will be several months well into uh, 2021 before that vaccine is even available or widely distributed to the general population. Thank you, Dr. Caldoun. Uh, Kristen Lowe, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Thank you. Um, taking a look at the outbreak map that you mentioned at the beginning, restaurants and bars, I think 54 outbreaks associated with that. I was wondering how many cases are associated with those outbreaks. And um, also looking at the outbreak map, you know, construction is is much higher than restaurants. So why are restaurants and bars shut down and construction not shut down? Yeah, so I want to uh, make clear that the information that we receive on the situation report is what um, outbreaks the local health departments are aware of and they are working on. I do not have um, for that situation report does not provide the number of, of cases associated with each one of those outbreaks. Um, we have it for schools um, because that's a different part of that situation report. Can I, this is Robert Gordon, can I just make a, a more general point in response to that question? Um, Absolutely, Director. It is, it is much easier to trace cases to um, people's places where people uh, live, like institutional settings, or work or go to school, where they have core identification with those places. With restaurants and bars, we are talking about places where a person might spend an hour. And it is much harder to draw those connections. 
Thank you, Director. Uh, Christy Tanner. You may unmute Hi, and ask sorry. your question. Just unmuted, thanks. Um, I'm wondering with the, the latest news on um, some of the problems with case investigation and keeping up with the number of cases, what has been the impact on um, the response public health wise? And then second, um, if the state has done anything to help any local health departments or what help is out there for local health departments that are struggling to respond? Sure. So we've, you know, we've been working with our local health department partners. Um, we've developed, a, uh, I mentioned the trace force system. We've also developed a um, set of uh, staff who are um, able to um, take over for contact tracing and case investigation at the request of local health departments. And I think all but two of them in the state have taken advantage of that um, support in in one form or another. Um, we've also developed a texting platform so that if someone is a contact of a case, you know, we, we, we like to be able to reach out um, in some format to those individuals at least once a day for their quarantine period. Um, so we have a texting platform that does that reach out um, to take some of the burden off. Uh, and we've also worked with local health to talk about, you know, given the number of case, um, the case, the sheer volume of cases that we're dealing with right now, how can we make sure that we're getting, you know, the, the crucial information that we need and that we're consistent in our investigations. So we've, we have um, come up with an abbreviated case investigation form that will help to shorten the period of time um, that someone needs to be on the phone with a, with a case. Uh, which um, should enable us to get to more cases. Okay, um, I still see a couple of hands up with for Maureen Halliday. Did you have another question or is your hand still up? I did not have another question. Okay, how about you, Karen? So far? Uh, yes, actually, I do have another question. I'm wondering if you can tell me how many additional employees the um, MDHHS has had to hire to, to cope with this pandemic? Uh, so I don't have that some total um, number. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Kaldu. No, this is Lynn. I was just going to say we can, we can work on that, Karen, and I can get back with you. Okay, great. And I'm also wondering about budgetary considerations. Um, you know, this has got to all be costing a tremendous amount of money that wasn't budgeted. And I'm, I'm wondering whether or not, you know, the MDHHS is going to have to somehow request more, more money from the legislature. You know, how, how are you funding this and what kind of difficulties are you, um, you know, encountering due to budgetary issues and what's the solution? Yeah, I, I can take that. So, um, We have uh, depended on federal dollars uh, to supplement state dollars, and in particular funding under the CARES Act. That funding uh, must be used by December 30th, and Washington's failure for months now to provide additional funding for the massive public health expenses that we face is uh, an enormous challenge for the department and for the state. 